uh, I'd first of all like to thank the people at Ratio for organizing this great conference and for really taking great care of us as, as speakers. And uh, it's, it's really an, an extremely professional uh, setting and a great experience for all of us. Uh, then, uh, when I talk about quantum nonsense, I actually have to credit a person who has been a great source of inspiration and also a great source of motivation for me by spreading copious amounts of quantum nonsense that actually more than I, than I, w I, could, I will ever be able to cover today that, was, that would take a whole, a whole semester of lectures. And uh, this person is Deepak Chopra. <laughs> now, Deepak Chopra has written 75 books chock full of nonsense. And uh, 21 of them were New York Times bestsellers. And uh, the, uh, actually, the, the one of the worst that I've heard of is Quantum Healing. And uh, that, that alone has sold 800,000 copies, which is about 800 times as many as my book has sold so far. <laughs> uh, it, it got him the Ig Nobel Prize, the prize for scientific results that cannot uh, should or should not be replicated. And uh, he writes wisdom in his book like, physicists now accept interconnectedness, interconnectedness as a ruling principle. I don't know any of those physicists, but still. So what if quantum reality was just as present in our own thoughts, emotions, and desires? And finally, so the quantum mechanical body as a formation of intelligence has a plausible place in non-local reality. Now, if you don't understand this last sentence, Congratulations. There is serious psychological research showing that people who say they understand Deepak Chopra quotes are considerably less intelligent than those who don't. <laughs> so, so uh, if uh, I want to tell you what quantum healing is about, uh, the best way of doing this is to actually heal somebody. So I do need a volunteer now, somebody who needs to be healed. Oh, uh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, come up to the stage, please. Now, you might ask yourself two things. First of all, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm home. What's your name? Tanya. Tanya, hello. Uh, now, you don't have to... For, for, first of all, you can, might, might ask yourself, is he able to do this? Does he know how to do this? Now, uh, since I'm a physicist, I can tell you that Everybody who has a degree in physics knows a heck of a lot more about quantum physics than 95% of all quantum healers. And uh, second, you might ask yourself, is he allowed to do this? Is he allowed to heal somebody? I mean, I'm not a, doc not a medical doctor. I don't even have the German that actually exists alternative pr practitioner's exam. Uh, I'm, I have no medical degree whatsoever. Well, um, I'm not, I'm not sure about Bulgaria, so let's just say there's a satire here. But uh, in Germany, I'm actually allowed to do this. I'm actually allowed to heal somebody because the highest German court has ruled that spiritual healers, and quantum healers are spiritual healers, spiritual healers uh, do not need an alternative uh, practitioner's exam because nobody in his right mind would actually expect medical attendance from a spiritual healer. <laughs> so. The highest German court says that I'm allowed to heal you because the highest German court knows that you know that I can't heal you in the first place. <laughs> so, uh, let's get to work. First of all, you don't have to tell me what you want to be healed of. So, this, it, just in case you... So, uh, that, uh, we don't need an anamnesis. We don't, I don't have to examine you either. All the exchange of information goes through quantum entanglement. Um, Second, uh, what you do have to do is you have to think about what it would be like if you were healed. Can you do that? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> no, no, just, just think about it. Just think about it in, in your mind. Uh, next, I'm going to think about, I'm, I'm going to imagine that you are healed. And uh, then I have to touch two points of your, on your body. Uh, it's, it doesn't matter which points, you can remain dressed. Yeah, just, just, yeah, <laughs> you can, you can, you can stre stretch out your arm, that's fine. Okay, thank you. We just need two points for the quantum entanglement to work. And uh, now, uh, I hope you're feeling better already because only the first session is free. Any future session, I will have to charge you for it. Thank you <laughs> and goodbye. So, this is physics. <laughs> and... Uh, if, if you are now thinking that this cannot possibly be true, he must have made this up, this has to be satire, well, I got the directions of how to do this out of a scientific paper that somebody got a PhD for at the University of Frankfurt-Oder in Germany. So this is actually, 
it published in a, in a, in a serious PhD thesis. Uh, and, but uh, quantum physics isn't the only part of physics that you can use to do strange things with. And this slide has taken me about five minutes of research. I needed five minutes to find three books that use the theory of relativity to explain why you can heal somebody by putting your hands on that person, to explain how you can heal Earth, or to explain why shamanism works and you can travel into other, uh, other dimensions with your mind and, and uh, find your spirit animal and things like this. All works based on the theory of relativity. So if we uh, want to think about uh, what is true and what is wrong as far as quantum physics and the theory of relativity goes, uh, well, I'm going to have to explain quantum physics and the theory of relativity to you, right? So I have about five minutes for each, uh, which should uh, just about do. So um, the theory of relativity. Um, let's look at the basics of the theory of relativity. Uh, imagine you look at the speed of light, and the speed of light is pretty fast. It's about 300,000 kilometers per second, which is a lot. On the other hand, uh, we're moving quite a bit too. We're moving around the sun. The Earth is moving around the sun in an orbit, and the, the speed of the Earth along this orbit is about 30 kilometers per second, which is by far not the speed of light, obviously, but it's not nothing either. I mean, it's about a 10,000th of the speed of light, so in the 19th century, as uh, I mean, the first fairly decent measurement uh, of the speed of light was uh, uh, on by astronomical ways was in the, in the 18th century. In the 19th century, uh, we had the first decent measurement of the speed of, of light on Earth with light on Earth. And then in the second half of the 19th century, measurements of the speed of light got better and better. And uh, Albert Michelson was one of the person who, persons who drove that and, and got better and better results for the speed of light. And uh, he had this idea, if you measure the speed of light in the direction that the Earth is moving around the Sun, like as the Earth is moving with the speed of light, you should measure a slightly different value than if you're me measuring the speed of light going the other way, because you, in, one in one case you're moving along with the light, and in the other case you're moving opposite to the light. So you should, should get two different values. And he measured that, and he didn't find anything. And he made a better, better measurement, and he still didn't find anything. And then, together with a chemist called Morley, he made an even more precise measurement, and he still didn't find anything. So, at that point, uh, I, uh, they, he came to the conclusion that, obviously, the speed of light is independent of how you move, which is kind of strange. I mean, imagine you are, you are watching a car passing you, going past you at 100 kilometers an hour, and then you're moving along with the car, and the car is 100 kilometers an hour faster than you but it's still going at the same speed. Or are you going the other way, and the car is coming, onto, uh, coming come the other way, and uh, the car is still passing you with a speed of 100 kilometers per hour, but it's also passing another observer who's just standing there with 100 kilometers per hour. The car, that car is completely, that car cannot exist. But that's exactly what light does. At least that's what Michelson found. And theoretical physicists in the second, second half of the 19th century, around 19, early 20th century, had quite a hard time explaining that. And finally, two people, Hendrik Lorenz and Albert Einstein, came up with mathematical solutions. Uh, the one from Hendrik Lorenz is, I mean, the mathematical side is completely identical. The interpretations are different. Nowadays, we know that Einstein's interpretation makes, makes a heck of a lot more sense. And uh, the, uh, the thing is, uh, if you try, I mean, th that, that's one, one thing, that the speed of light is always the same. The other assumption that you have to make, or the other knowledge that you have to start with, is uh, that physics doesn't change. The laws of physics don't change if you're moving this way around the sun or that way around the sun. The laws of physics are the same in the spring as they are in the fall. So that's, that was the other assumption that Einstein started with. And he found the only way he could reconcile the idea that the laws of physics don't change no matter how you move with the fact that the speed of light doesn't change no matter how you move with, with respect to the light. The only way he could get this together is to, is to, to say that as you, as you get faster and faster and as you're approaching the speed of light, 
space and time changes and mass changes too. So as you approach the speed of light, time slows down, space contracts and your mass grows, which is kind of counterintuitive. It's pretty strange, but that's for all we know, that's what happens. And uh, that applies to any observer moving in a straight line without speeding up or slowing down. Now, how many observers do we have in space, uh, anywhere on Earth or anywhere else, who moves in a straight line without speeding up or slowing down? They don't exist for the very simple reason the Earth is in orbit around the Sun, the Sun is in orbit around the center of the universe, so everything is moving in generally in circles or in, in ellipsoid shapes. Uh, nothing is moving in a straight line, really. So Einstein very quickly came to the point that he had to generalize this and get this theory to work for observers that are moving in orbits around large masses. And uh, yeah, he, he, he took, it took him about two years to figure out how this works in principle and then it took him about eight years together with the best mathematicians of the world to work this out mathematically and he ended up with the general theory of relativity. And the general theory of relativity says that space and time don't only change as you're speeding up and approaching the speed of light, space and time also change in the vicinity of very large masses. So that's the, and, and both, all these changes are very precisely calculated and that is all very stringent and there is no, no uh, arbitrariness in there. This is all hard calculation and very, very precise. So. Uh, can we test this? And in fact, we all do every day. I mean, most of all, you will have a smartphone, and your smartphone, in most cases, will have uh, GPS, satellite navigation. And satellite navigation finds your position by measuring time signals from different satellites. Basically, all these satellites do is they radio the exact time all the time, and uh, your phone measures the time signals from different satellites and figures out how delayed they are, one satellite compared to the other, and out of these delays it calculates how, how far the different satellites are away, and th that way your phone knows where it is. Uh, but the satellites aren't standing still, they're moving with about one hundred thousandth of the speed of light. So there is a relativistic effect slowing down time for these satellites. On the other hand, these satellites are not on the surface of the Earth, as we, as we are, they are away from the center of gravity of the Earth. So that has an, an effect according to general relativity. They are farther away from a large mass, so time is actually faster on these satellites. And we have to correct for this. And GPS corrects for exactly this effect. And if GPS weren't correcting for this exact, exact, exactly this effect, then the time signal from every single satellite would be 11 kilometers wrong after just one day. Now this kind of evens itself out because we're only taking the relative differences between satellites, but uh, still it would cause an error. And actually, the, the, when they had the first satellite in orbit, the first GPS satellite, they left the, the, the relativity correction off for the first couple of days, and they could observe just that. The signal was wrong by uh, a significant amount of kilometers after even just one day because time go runs faster on these satellites. So this is, in a nutshell, the theory of relativity and how we can test it and how we know that it has to be in some way true. Now let's go from relativity to quantum mechanics, quantum physics. So what is quantum mechanics about? I and mean, quantum mechanics as the main theory of quantum physics. Quantum mechanics is about, not about very large or very, very fast objects, it's about very small objects like an atom. And uh, if we look at what an atom looks like, I mean, we all know what an atom looks like, right? I mean, we s I've seen, we see these pictures up there. So the first one is uh, the, the March for Science. Scientists should know what an atom looks like. The International Atomic Energy Agency. There's one from a school book, one from a tech-based company, and uh, one from a studying website. And uh, this is uh, a picture of my grandmother <laughs> as a teenager. And if you're wondering why I'm showing you this picture, that is because when this picture was taken in 1928, people already knew, knew that this idea of an atom has to be wrong. So if we're looking at what an atom actually looks like, and we're trying to draw an atom that is somewhat more realistic, it would look something like this. 
So the nucleus, the red dot in the middle, is still way too large, but I've drawn it to a size that you can, that you can see it. And the electrons are not in orbits around this nucleus. They are just, uh, they are there in a kind of smeared out cloud. And uh, you cannot say the electron is here now and there then. You can only say that the electron is here with a certain probability or there with a certain probability. And it's not like you cannot measure where it is. In the end, you can, but you cannot really, it, it isn't moving. It, isn't, it doesn't have a defined place. It, it is actually, the electron is actually smeared out. And this whole thing is called a quantum state. And if you describe it mathematically, it's, it's described by a wave function. And the wave function basically allows you to calculate these probabilities. And these quantum states have some interesting properties. Uh, one is called the observer effect, and I'm going to get to these in, in some more detail in a second. One is called superposition, so they, you, can, you can have different quantum states working at the same time. Uh, they, they can be quantum states can be entangled. Uh, I'll also get to what that means. One thing that is often forgotten in this context is an effect called decoherence. These quantum states exist exactly until they get in touch with the outside world. So if we have an isolated atom, we can talk of an isolated quantum state. Uh, the moment and, and that has all these special effects, uh, the moment this quantum state gets in touch with the outside world, these, for example, because you're trying to measure it, these special effects go away. And the, an electron, the moment it gets in touch with the outside world, does not behave like a quantum state, it behaves like an, a particle, like an electron. And that's really important to keep in mind. All of the, all of the special effects of quantum physics only exist as long as what you are looking at is totally isolated from the outside world. And what that means, we'll get to in a second. Okay, so now the observer effect. What is, what is the observer effect? Now, you want to observe an object, like the one in the picture uh, that you've all seen. If we want to know where that ball is, uh, it's pretty simple. We just look at it and we can play it. If, however, we are trying to observe an electron or any other tiny particle, we have a problem. Uh, that thing is small. It's like really, really small. So obviously we need some kind of detector, some measuring device. But we still have another problem. Uh, the measuring device is in the upper corner and uh, the, the electron is uh, somewhere here. So we have to get the information from this electron that the electron is here into the measuring device. So we need some kind of a probe. For example, we need light. A photon, a light particle that scatters off the electron, flies into the detector, then the detector says, OK, the, 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 the photon is coming from that direction, so the electron has to be there. Which is almost true, because what the detector will tell you is that the electron was there before it collided with the photon. Because by colliding with the photon, the electron gets kind of a, a kick of momentum, and it gets moved somewhere else. And that is a fundamental principle in quantum mechanics. You cannot measure anything without changing it, uh, which is very simple. I mean, it's closely related to this effect of decoherence. In general, you cannot measure anything without making it decoherent, because to measure something means you have to get it in contact with a measuring device, and the measuring device is a part of the outside world, right? I mean, the measuring device is something big that I can touch. It's, it's definitely the outside world. So. There, you cannot measure anything without changing it. It's a kind of a specifically quantum mechanical effect, but it's not that far away from what our everyday life tells us. Because if you want to see the ball, you need light too. And if you don't have light, you have a hard time finding the ball without touching it and changing it by touching it. And even the light shining on the ball tends to change the ball and tends to have an effect on the ball that is non-negligible. Well, it is negligible for us because we don't know, want to know the position of the ball with extreme precision, but light shining on the ball will, of course, on, a, on an atomic level, transfer energy to the ball. It may even move the ball. It will heat up the ball. So this is not something that is totally out of this world. This is not something that is totally strange or absurd. It's just something uh, that becomes important as we're looking at tiny particles, even though it's not that important as we're looking at everyday things. So we have these two worlds. We have the world, the classical world of macroscopic objects where, that have a defined position, where everything is clear, where we can, this is here, it's moving there, 
uh, it's, it's something we can touch, we can see, and on the other hand, we have these particles. As long as they're isolated from the outside world, they have all these strange quantum effects. And for a long time, physicists have been wondering what this is what these, with these two worlds. What happens the moment we, we measure and the, the, the electron goes from this quantum state to a particle that's kind of part of the classical world? What happens there? And they, they came up with things like wave functions collapsing and, and strange uh, philosophical interpretations that actually uh, they, they, they uh, go through philosophy up to today. And philosophers wonder about this. And in fact, uh, from a physics point of view, actually that's uh, rather uninteresting because meanwhile we know, and we've known this theoretically for about 40 years, and uh, we can experiment this in the last 15, 20 years, we know there is a transition zone in between. This is not a clear cut, these are not two worlds. There is a transition zone if, as you go from single particles to larger sets of particles, for example molecules. Uh, you'll find that these molecules will in part behave like classical objects and they will still have some, if you measure very, very precisely, you can still find quantum effects of molecules, even of relatively large molecules. And that's experimentally really interesting. Um, but it's nothing really that mysterious from, from a point of view of principle. And every time that you read in the newspaper, somebody has discovered quantum effects in a macroscopic object, in a big object, it's usually an experiment that is somewhere there in the middle. The big object is going to be a molecule or something like this. Uh, not, not, uh, it's not going to be like uh, this TV or so. Or th this there are very different scales of big objects. This is something that we can have different definitions. So, in fact, everything that happens in our daily lives is actually a part of this classical world here. There are no quantum states uh, in our everyday life. And so, so, there are no quantum effects in our everyday life. But let's take a closer look at some of these special effects. And let's start out with uh, the superposition of quantum states. What does superposition mean? Well, Let's look at some radioactive atoms. And let's look, for example, of, of iodine-131, which is uh, the typical stuff that uh, is critical in the first couple of days after nuclear accidents or nuclear ex detonations. Uh, uh, iodine-131 uh, uh, goes into your thyroid and ca can cause cancer there. And the, the good part about it is it has a half-life of about eight days. So after eight days, only half of the iodine-131 atoms are still there. The rest has decayed to xenon-131, which is harmless. And then after 16 days, uh, only one-fourth is left. And after 24 days, only one-eighth is left, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. So from a classical physics perspective, that means that after eight days, half of the atoms that were there before are decayed. From a quantum mechanical point of view, you cannot tell one atom from the other. So from a quantum mechanical point of view, after eight days, all the atoms are half decayed. So that's just the, the view of quantum mechanics. The, uh, y so if you were kind of, which is kind of absurd, if you're going back to one atom, after, after half eight days, as long as we haven't measured, one atom is half decayed and half isn't decayed. Uh, so the, the atom, as quantum mechanics says, is in a superposition of the decayed and of the non-decayed state. What does that mean for actual life with radioactive substances? Absolutely nothing. For the effect of the e on the everyday world, if you take the classical view or the quantum mechanical view, in this case, makes no difference whatsoever. If you get too in too close contact with, uh, uh, with iodine-131, uh, that's not healthy. So, uh, trying to explain this difference between the quantum physical world of very small particles and large objects, uh, Schrödinger made this, uh, came up with this thought experiment with an, an example that he tried to use to explain something. So he said, okay, what happens if we have this, particle, this, this atom that we know after eight days is going to be half decayed and half non-decayed, and we take what, just one of those atoms and we take a measurement device that will measure exactly when this atom decays, and this measurement device is co co connected to another device which will then kill a cat that is locked up in a box with all of these, with the atom and with the measuring device and so forth. Then if you take the observer effect literally, then after eight days, the atom would be half decayed, the measuring device would have half measured that and the cat would be half dead, right? 
Unt uh, until somebody opens the box and looks inside and you have an observer. And the moment you have an observer, you make a measurement and then you know the cat is alive or dead. Before that, it's half alive and half dead. And actually, Erwin Schrödinger's idea, if you read his original paper on that, what he was trying to explain is, no, this cannot work with cats. He was assuming that everybody knew that this is so absurd that a cat can be half alive and half dead. That that was the, uh, he thought that was the ideal way to demonstrate that macroscopic objects like cats are fundamentally different from particles. Unfortunately, that's not what people understand. And philosophy is, philosophers, esoterics and so forth are still talking about cats that are dead and alive at the same point. I mean, what we're missing at this point is very simple, that the observer is not the person looking into the box. The observer is, uh, is the, uh, the measuring device. And that the observer has to be the measuring device is uh, connected to the absurdity of the name of the observer effect. Uh, the, obser the name observer effect uh, comes from the late 1920s, when nobody doing physics could actually imagine a measurement without somebody making the measurement. If we're looking at, t at to CERN nowadays, at, in the LHC experiment at CERN, they make billions and billions of billions of measurements within a second. Nobody, no person is making these measurements. There is no observer. These, the data from these measurements is automatically pre-selected by fast-acting uh, electronic devices before it even enters the computer. Then it's, they are processed in a computer, and from the computer they are stored on storage devices. And then the data sits on these storage devices, and maybe some months, maybe some years later, some PhD student will take his software and analyze this data, and after he has analyzed this data, the PhD student looking at the results of his software will be the first actual human observer dealing with any of this. So there is no observer until years later in some cases. But of course there is an observer effect the moment the measurement is made. So, so the observer effect, just to make this clear again, has nothing to do with the observer. Uh, and therefore, that cannot, uh, one, one, whether you, when you open the box doesn't have anything to do with if the cat is alive. It's just uh, the measurement that's th that decides if, uh, if the, uh, the, the atom is decayed or not. The cat will always be either dead or alive. But the problem with, with Schrodinger's cat is that it, it still lives on. I mean, as I told you, it, 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 it continues in, in, in esoterics and philosophy and popular culture. Uh, so at first I wasn't very surprised when I found this headline here, for example, the version from the Washington Post, Schrodinger's cat just got even weirder and even more confusing. So I thought, okay, this, these journalists must have gotten something wrong. So let's look at a more sciencey publication. Let's for look, for example, at science news. They are only dealing with science. They should understand what they're doing. And their headline is, Schrodinger's cat now dead and alive in two boxes at once. <laughs> this gets stranger and stranger. So I was looking at the original publication, uh, not, not, not the, the scientific publication, but the original publication from the press office of the institute that did it, which was in that case Yale University. And their headline was doubling down on Schrödinger's cat. And at this point, I was getting slightly annoyed because I was wondering, uh, what's going on here? Yale physicists have given Schrödinger's fam famous cat a second box to play, and now this is strange. So I looked at the actual science publication, published in Science, May 2016. And the title is A Schrödinger Cat Living in Two Boxes. And then I looked inside the publication what these people had actually done. Well they were using two cavities the size of film boxes, if you still remember film boxes from, from analog cameras. Uh, and in each of these film boxes, they had created a microwave signal that was being reflected up and down. And they had created entanglement between these two microwave signals. And I'm, which is an interesting result. Nice, interesting that you can do this. It's a nice piece of physics ex experimenting. The only thing is, where's the cat? And the answer, of course, is there is no cat. They're just using the cat to make their results interesting. They're talking about Schrodinger's cat, although their experiment has nothing whatsoever to do with it. And that is, unfortunately, something that happens in physics all the time. 
And it gets even worse. I mean, this, the first, this is bad communication about serious physics, okay? Now let's look at, at another headline. Schrödinger's microbe. Physicists plan to put a living organism in two places at once. Uh, okay, now uh, again, let's go to the actual science publication. And the actual science publication is quantum superposition and entanglement and state teleportation of a mi microorganism in an electromechanical oscillator. So I looked into that publication and what were, they, what were the scientists actually trying or, or suggesting to do? This is a theoretical science paper. They didn't actually do this ex experiment and as far as I know, nobody ever did. They suggested this in January 2016, so about two years ago. They, they, had, they, they wanted to use a tiny resonator and this is a, a sheet of metal uh, that is the, the, the thickness of this, this uh, this metal is one ten thousandth of a millimeter and the whole thing, the whole disk of metal has only has a diameter of 0.015 millimeters. So this is really, really, a really, really tiny mechanical oscillator. You make this thing swing and then you cool it down to temperatures close to absolute zero. And uh, you get to a point where all the energy that this thing has left is the quantum mechanical uh, zero uh, point energy and then the, it, it's the, you find that with the zero-point energy, it's still going to be swinging, swinging with an amplitude of about four billionth of a millimeter, basically nothing. And they said, okay, now if we take a bacterium that is small enough to not disturb the swinging oscillator and put it on the oscillator, that bacterium is going to be in an undefined position. It's going to be in two places at once. The weird thing about this is, I mean, this bacterium has a size of 0 0.0006 millimeters, which is way, way, way larger than this uncertainty of the position. So this bacterium is not going to be in two places at once. It's at best, it's going to be, the, the, its position is going to be somewhat unclear. Uh, as far, and this, this whole, ex that's, that was the only point of the experiment. This whole experiment is totally pointless. They suggested doing it. I, as far as I know, nobody has ever done it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I hope nobody ever will because it's a pure waste of money. But uh, this, th they, this is not only bad science pu public, uh, publication, this is, or sci bad science PR, this is bad science. Very simple. And what this does is, we see that here. This is from a German blog about detoxing. Now, if detoxing, removing toxins from your body is something that uh, you're worried about, uh, the best thing to detox is have a liver. And if you have a functioning liver, that will do all the detoxing you will ever need. And if you don't have a functioning liver, Get a liver transplant quick, otherwise you're dead. So, yeah. Um, still, there are people doing detoxing, and this detox blog said the following thing uh, in an article about Schrodinger's cat. Through his experiences and expectations linked to them, the observer himself controls the result. Misunderstanding of the observer effect. His emotions determine the vibration of his thinking, and his thinking manifests matter. In this case, Mr. Schrödinger's cat. If Mr. Schrödinger, when opening the box, is in panic about finding his cat dead, that will happen. If he is happily looking forward to a cuddling experience with his cat, that is what will happen. Quantum mechanics is really cool. And there is one true sentence, one true statement in this whole article, and that's quantum mechanics is really cool. Unfortunately, this lady didn't understand a word of it. Uh, and this is not just, I mean, this is from a German publication, you find the same in basically, I d I, unfortunately I can't read Bulgarian, but you'll find uh, stuff like this in basically any language. <laughs> so, uh, an, a, one a, a special quantum effect that comes up in this is entanglement, and I'll quickly, as the last effect uh, that we're looking at, I'll quickly look at what entanglement is. Now, entanglement is created when two particles are created at the same time. For example, you have energy, and energy decays into an electron and a positron. An electron, the particle, positron, the antiparticle with that. So you have, from the classical perspective, two particles. From a quantum mechanical par uh, perspective, these two particles are still one quantum state. And uh, this uh, one quantum state means you can make measurements on one of the two particles, and you will know the properties of the other. Now you can say, okay, if I find a right shoe somewhere, it's quite probable that I'm going to find a left shoe somewhere. So, uh, yeah, it's not just you know the proper properties with which the other particle was created. You can also make slight, if you're careful enough, you, for example, with a magnet, you can make slight changes to, the other, to one particle and make measure the results on the other at the same time. 
And that is something that is kind of odd and that got some smart people really thinking. Now, the limitation of this is, again, uh, decoherence. Uh, this only works in as long as the whole thing is isolated from the outside world. The first interaction with the outside world ends this entanglement. And the first, un unless we're talking light particles, I mean, with light this works over a couple of hundred kilometers, actually, and you can use that for, for quantum communication, hopefully sometime in the future, but uh, except with light, uh, the f next contact with the outside world is usually the very next atom, which is after like a billionth of a, of a millimeter or something like this. So this is really not a remote effect in the classical sense of remote at all. Still, there are people, there is the, the German parapsychologist Walter von Lukadu, who said that the German national football coach should create quantum entanglement between his players. Uh, there is Giovanni Vota, who in a book on transcendental meditation wrote, uh, used uh, quantum entanglement as an explanation why violent crime should go down because people in the same city are doing transcendental meditation. Uh, my explanation would be that um, if you get the criminals to meditate, of course they can't com commit any crimes, but well, he, he's, he's arguing that in a sli slightly different way. Uh, there are also, and that is interesting, I mean, my, I started out as a physicist, I uh, currently work as a management consultant, or actually I've been working as a management consultant for the last 15 years, and there are management consultants doing this. There is, this is an example from a Swiss company, there are, this is just a random example, there are loads of companies doing this. Quantum physics, they, and they say about the way they work, quantum physics today assumes that the space in each atom is filled with countless elementary particles. They can connect, entanglement, and exchange information. And with quantum physical technology, it's now possible to scan the information carriers of the zero-point field and inform them. The system lauded by experts uh, allows the use of quantum physics based on white noise. So what do they actually do? Where a normal management consultant would do a market analysis, would do a competitive uh, competition analysis, would have to gather all kinds of data, they just read all the information that they need out of white noise. Then they make some calculation with it, and then the company that they're working for doesn't even have to change anything. They just put the correct information take the correct information and send it back into the white noise, and they're done. And if you're wondering who spends money for this, they have their client list online. It includes one of the largest European insurance companies, two large uh, engineering companies, a Swiss private bank, and one of the largest food companies of the world. And this is not just one company doing this. I found in, in the German-speaking area alone two different systems being used and dozens of consulting firms doing this. So, if we want to avoid spending money for this, how can we find out uh, if quantum physics is something that we have to take into account or that we can use, and uh, what isn't? Of course, not everybody is a physicist. So, let's try to find some simple rules. First of all, it's helpful to know how quantum nonsense works and how it is created. So, if we want to create quantum nonsense, first we start out with a well-established but hard-to-understand statement from modern, ph modern physics, and I recommend starting with something if you're not going with if you're going uh, if you're going into relativity instead of quantum mechanics. We could start with E equals m c squared. Everybody has heard it. Very few people know what it actually means. Uh, there is a statement that energy and mass are equivalent. Okay, up to this point, every physicist would agree. Then you start to mix the scientific terms and their everyday meaning, which means you go from mass to matter, and you go from are equivalent to are the same. And you come up with a sentence like, therefore, matter is simply energy. And at this point, a well-meaning physicist will say, well, I know what you're trying to say, but you shouldn't really be saying it that way. And once your audience has accepted that, you just go on with, that energy is the energy of our minds. And there we are in the field of total bullshit. <laughs> and why is this working? Well, this is working because relativity and quantum mechanics are obviously well-accepted theories. I mean, Relativity is by Einstein, it has to be correct. Uh, and and uh, although it's totally contrary to our intuition and uh, contrary to our everyday experience. And therefore, if we accept this, therefore we have to accept other ideas that are contrary to everyday intuition and experience too, right? 
The thing is that relativity and quantum mechanics are contrary to our intuition and experience because they are about things that are not part of our everyday experience. We don't usually deal with objects moving close to the speed of light and we don't usually deal with single atoms. Uh, so if you are applying them the, the same principles to objects of everyday life, you're doing something wrong and that's something that's often lost in this proce process. So if you're wondering if quantum physics is important for your life, ask yourself, do you consist of just a few atoms or uh, is your body temperature below minus 270 degree degrees Celsius? I would be wondering if you were here, actually. Uh, if, if not, then uh, the results of quantum physics are going to be exactly identical to those of classical physics and classical chemistry. And if you're wondering if the theory of relativity is important for your life, uh, well, you, you move faster usually than a million kilometers per hour. I mean, even if you're speeding up, guess. Are you heavier than at least like a mid-sized comet? The one that Rosetta flew to or so, that's where it, you vaguely start thinking about relativity. Or is your, is your, are, are you making decisions in nanoseconds inter intervals? Unless you answer these questions with yes, uh, then the results are going to be identical with classical physics. So, and, and finally, I want to give you some red flags to keep in mind with, uh, if, if you want to be warned of quantum nonsense. If you come across statements like, everything is connected, or the, deter the, the observer determines the outcome, or everything consists of waves, of fields, everything consists of energy, or matter doesn't exist. These are all red flags. Whatever that person says th next is pro very probably nonsense. And unfortunately, and, and we've, I've seen the t-shirts that, uh, that uh, Ratio is using, uh, uh, most, the, the vast majority of references to Schrodinger's cat are also nonsense. Uh, in, in, in fact, there is, there is a famous quote by Stephen Hawking, uh, every time I hear of Schrodinger's cat, I, I'd like to reach for a gun, and maybe it's a good thing he couldn't. So, uh, so let's, let's get to some examples to close this out. Uh, and I've just, just uh, looked at some, some random things that I came across. Spirituality without quantum physics is an incomplete picture of reality, says quantum physics expert the Dalai Lama. Uh, Homeopathy is a science of quantum mechanics. Dowsing with a dowsing rod is exploring the quantum universe through the frontiers of your mind. Uh, there is quantum alchemy and quantum astrology, and of course, sex and quantum physics, the tantric yogi tells all. <laughs> and uh, finally, getting to a special field of uh, quantum physics, uh, actually it's something that's on the borderline between quantum, quantum physics or touches on quantum physics and real relativity, tachyons. Tachyons are particles moving faster than the speed of light. And, um, well, since the, the, the theory of relativity says nothing, can, nothing that has mass, at least, can move faster than the speed of light, or nothing that has zero mass or a, non, uh, or a real mass, not an irreal mass, uh, can move, be faster than the speed of light, people have been looking for things that move faster than the speed of light for about a century now. And that's a really interesting thing to do research to, because if you found something like this, it, that, it would be like an instant Nobel Prize. Uh, if you find something and you, others cannot prove you wrong, uh, you're headed for, to, to Oslo, definitely. So, uh, the thing is, uh, so, so tachyons are really a hypothetical particle. Nobody has ever found any. But in the Netherlands, or in, in Belgium, uh, you can learn to do massages with them. Actually, you could get such a massage in Ruppolding in Germany until I started blogging about that. So then suddenly that massage disappeared from their, uh, from their uh, menu. And uh, if that massage has gotten you kind of warmed up and you're looking for a little more, there are things you can do at home too with, uh, with tachyons. Uh, for example, you can use a lubricant uh, with tachyons. Uh, a lubricant for sex faster than the speed of light. Uh, yeah. Uh, if, if that has somehow exhausted you and you somehow cannot manage, there is the, the, uh, sex, uh, the tachyon sex tonic for men. And uh, finally, for the ultimate experience, my favorite product, not that I actually would own one, but uh, the favorite product that I came across on the, on the net, is uh, the tachyon glass plug, which you can insert into your root chakra. 
Uh, and at, at this point, uh, you know why in German we have this, this, uh, this expression about uh, certain products, this product is for the ass. Thank you. <laughs> so, for, 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 those, for those of you who, uh, who, who read German, uh, I have a blog, quantenquark.com, uh, where if we can... There, they took the, tr the transparency away. Okay, uh, they have a blog in, in German, quantenquark.com. There is also a book that you could can order either through the blog or through Amazon. And uh, if you if you are able to read German, uh, there, that that says pretty much all that I have in my talk, plus much much more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.